Lisa has <laughs> been helping me <laughs> try to study today because I got confused and I was in a pickle. I didn't know what in the world to do and so she has a lot of wisdom and she's a word girl. That's what I've been saying ever since I met her. She's my word girl. She grew up in Rama, and the word of faith people know the word and uh, so she's blessed me by helping me. But in Numbers the 20th chapter, um, the first few verses we see that uh, where the children of Israel are in the wilderness of Zin, Z-I-N. In some translations it says Sin, S-I-N, but it's pronounced Zin. Uh, now, in this particular scripture in Numbers, the 20th chapter, it says in the Amplified, it is the first month in the 40th year. Now, in the context of Numbers, we have to remember that when they sent the spies out, which was not God's plan or intention, the people wanted to do that, but He allowed them to go. And they went over into the land to spy it out for 40 days, and they didn't mix their faith with the report that God had already told them that the land was theirs. So He tells them when they return that 10 spies that have the bad report and Joshua and Caleb had the good report that we're well able to take it. They mixed their faith with it. Hebrews 4 tells us that they entered into their rest when they mixed their faith with that. And we do too. We're not looking for a piece of real estate. Our rest and promised land is what? Jesus. He's our promised land. Okay. So they come out of Egypt. And when they come out of Egypt, they end up in the wilderness. In Exodus, the 17th chapter, you can find that they get to a point where he has provided manna for them and even quail because they wanted meat. But now they have no water. And God speaks to Moses in Exodus. And I'm going to get to numbers. I'm giving you background. We've already studied this. But then he gives Moses the word on Mount Horeb. There's a rock there. And he says, strike the rock and the water will flow. Right? Okay, that's Exodus 17. And they're over, at that particular time, they've just come out of Egypt. Now, they go through, we've been studying, now we're in numbers, they're, in, they're walking around in the wilderness. Um, we've gone over the tabernacle in Exodus, we've gone through last week looking at the spies and everything, and now we're up to chapter 20, and they are thirsty again. Um, that first one in Exodus the 17th, when God spoke to Moses and told him to strike the rock, and he did with the same rod that he struck the water of Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. Now the people are complaining again. And this is the end of the journey. Okay. They already learned when the spies went over and they came back and God said for... Every day that the spies were spying out the land, you will be punished one year in the wilderness. So they knew heading into the wilderness that they were going to be there for 40 years. It wasn't a surprise to them. Like sometimes we've taught that because they kept taking the same test and failing and they didn't mix faiths. So no, they knew going in. Why? Because God said He had to wipe out a whole generation of unbelief. And it set a precedent that 40 years is a generation. And so now we're in the first month of that 40th year. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years and they're still complaining. Hello? You look at it, you'll see it in chapter 20. They're still complaining. And they come to Moses because Moses, remember, is the mediator between God and man. So he's in type and shadow of Christ. And really, if they complain against Moses, who are they complaining against? God. They're complaining against God, and so God said, tells Moses, He says, you and Aaron gather the people together, and you take with you the rod, the same rod that he struck the first rock with, and the same rod that they, he used, that God used to help them cross the Red Sea. He said, you take that rod, and you and Aaron gather all the people, and at this point, they're in Kadesh. Okay? They're at Kadesh. Look at verse 13. Can you put Numbers 20? Verse 13 on the screen. Now I'm going to lead up to verse 13. 
So God tells Moses and Aaron, gather the people. And this time he said, take the rod with you, but speak to the rock. Right? Hear the command of God. The first time he told him to strike it. And God did a miraculous miracle. He brought water out of a rock. And they had enough water for six million plus people. Now this time he tells him, bring Aaron and the people together. Take the same rod, but this time I want you to speak to the rock. And when you speak to it, water will flow. Now, I'm going to have to go back up and, and we're going to have to look at this together. Verse 10. Go back up to verse 10. I'm sorry. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. Moses said to them, listen now you rebels. I want you to listen to what he says and look at it on the screen. Here now, you rebels, must we. Who's the we here? Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron. Must we bring water out of this rock? If it was God included, it would be a capital W. So the context is now, Moses is saying, I did it before. Must we bring water out of this rock? Verse 11. Then Moses raised his hand in anger, <laughs> and with his rod he struck the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock as God had commanded. Now I want to show you, what are we doing in Grace 101? We're finding grace from Genesis to Revelation. Did God give Moses a command? Did, did Moses obey it? Did God still provide water? That's grace. That's grace. Because if God didn't show grace and favor, He would have punished Moses, Aaron, and the rest of the people. Now there were consequences and Moses didn't get to go over. And God tells him in the next few verses, you're not going to go over. But I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you something here. He, it's, he did not, not get to go to the promised land because he struck the rock. He did not get to go to the promised land because he didn't believe. He didn't mix faith with the word that God had told him. Did God perform the miracle the first time when he said strike the rock? Yeah. Yes, he did. Now God gives him a similar situation... But the guidance here is different. What we have to be careful with is God doesn't always move in the same way. And you may be in a similar situation, but God may tell you to do something differently than you've already done and always done. But if you'll just have faith to believe that what He says He will do, He will do. Amen? Amen? But Moses, in his anger lifted up the rod, and he struck the rod twice. Now I'm going to give a play on words here for just a second. This is me. Who's the rock? How many times did he have to be beaten and slain? One time. Because the first time, water brings life. The first time when God said to Moses, strike the rock, was a type and shadow of the, the, the beating and the crucifixion of Christ that one time, once and for all, would bring forth life. He doesn't want us to keep beating Christ. But in pulpits across America and in our conversations and Bible studies, we keep beating up the body when God's told us to speak to the body. We don't beat up the body continually because God, His beating was our beating. We had one time, once and for all, Hebrews tells us, and so this second time, here when he raised his hand in anger and he struck the rock twice, the second time, instead of speaking, the water still poured out abundantly. That's grace. That's the grace of God. The congregation and their livestock drank fresh water. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe. He didn't say because you struck the rock. He didn't say because you disobeyed. He didn't say because you had anger. You didn't believe. 
You jump over to John 6, 28, 29, when the disciples were asking what work of God must we do. He said, the only work that you must do is to believe. Yes. Now, I, this is listen through this. Adultery doesn't send you to hell. Homosexuality doesn't send you to hell. Murder doesn't send you to hell. Unbelief. Now, each of those that I named are symptoms <laughs> of unbelief. Because you do not believe, then you act out in your unbelief and you carry out sin. And that unbelief is what will eventually send you to hell as it did. Moses and Aaron were not able to see the promised land because of unbelief. That unbelief manifests in different people's lives in different ways. That, that unbelief manifested in, in anger in, in uh, Moses' life right here. He had anger. But if he would have believed God, he wouldn't have had anger. Because if he'd have believed God, he'd have spoke to the rock and he wouldn't have struck the rock. He'd have been at peace. That's right. That voice of the Spirit. When that peace is shaken, stop, hold up. Listen. Let me finish verse 12. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, isn't it something that Aaron got thrown right in the mist and all he did was stand with Moses the whole time. He didn't do a thing. But God said, Moses and Aaron, you all gather the people. And he did. And Aaron's standing there with Moses. And Moses strikes the rock twice and Aaron doesn't get to go in either. <laughs> because he didn't believe. Because if he'd have believed. <laughs> I, you're getting a lot of bragging tonight. If I make a post on Facebook that is not good <laughs> it's demeaning others it's beating people up and it's not sure she's going to let me know that's what we're for for each other oh Aaron should have said now hold on here a second Mo the Lord said speak to that rock that's what she'd be saying now the Lord said speak to that rock don't beat the people up speak to them share them grace but because he didn't believe either says they both Because you didn't treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, you therefore shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. But you know who got to go? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua is the Hebrew name of Jesus. Yahshua. Who takes us in? We only get in through Yahshua. Joshua. Now verse 13, I'm just being honest with you, that's where I got stuck. I got stuck at verse 13. It says, these are the waters of Meribah. The word Meribah means strife and contention. Where the Israelites contended with the Lord and He showed Himself holy among them. Now, verse 1 says they're in Kadesh. Right? So in Numbers 20... They're in a place called Kadesh, K-A-D-E-S-H. And verse 13 calls it Meribah. Deuteronomy 35, 19, correct? Deuteronomy 35, 19 gives you the distinguishing because in Exodus 17 where the first one took place Rephidim Meribah two different occasions and God calls them both Meribah but they take place in two different locations but he distinguishes the diff what he's saying is in Kadesh there was strife and contention. In Ram, Rephidim, there was strife and contention because the people complained against Moses. He took it as a complaint against God Himself. And so in two different places, we see that the people of God are striving and in contention. Let me tell you what the law will cause you to do. It will cause you to strive. You're always striving to do more, striving to accomplish more, striving to obey more. And then what ends up happening is you'll get in contention with the one that passed down the law. 
But thank God Jesus came and gave us grace. When He showed up, He fulfilled the law. So now as a believer, you're not under that law and you don't strive and you don't contend. You rest. Are we obedient? Yes, but obedience is the fruit, not the root. Grace is the root, and because of God's grace, we obey. Because you can obey every single 613 law and still not make it in. How do we get in? There's only one way. His name is Jesus. And by His grace and His blood, that's how we make it in. I'm sorry, babe. 3419? See what I tell you. Thank you. So there's two different places that are mentioned as waters of Meribah. Kadesh and Rephidim. I'm sorry, babe. So we want to distinguish these two. One is where Moses strikes the rock and water comes forth. The other was where he was supposed to speak, but he struck the rock anyway and God shows his grace and still gives the water in abundance. Okay, let's move over to Numbers 21. I'm sorry, babe. 30. Not 34. Where did I come up with 34? Deuteronomy 1. Verse 19. I had the 19 right. So give me 50%. <laughs> okay. Uh, in Numbers 21 is where uh, the people were bit, being bitten with, by the snakes and they lifted up the bronze serpent, which we told you at the beginning of this teaching was a type and shadow of Christ being lifted up on the cross. Then we get over to verse 22. Verse 22. Numbers 22. And in Numbers 22, we have the story of Balak and Balaam. Their names are <laughs> alike, and sometimes people get confused. Balak is the king. Okay? Balak is the king of the Moabites. And you Bible scholars correct me if I'm wrong. B-A-L-A-B-A-L-A-K. He's a king. Balaam... What'd you say? You're all uh, confusing the teacher here. He's referred to as a diviner or a sorcerer. He's a Gentile. That's important. Because if you've ever heard that he was a prophet, that's not correct. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi, N-A-V-I-H. That's never used in this scripture. The word prophet is never used here. D diviner or sorcerer is the word that's used here. Now, a diviner works in divination, which is foretelling the future. Okay. Um, what are the psychic people? They don't foretell the future. They always take you to the past. They never... For now, a sorcerer, here's the thing about Balaam. He had a gift from God to foretell and see the future. But he was not connected with Yahweh. Or the, the Hebrews would write it Y-H-W-H. -H. Okay. They, the, he did not... He was using the gift that God had given him to foretell the future, but he wasn't using it in connection with Yahweh God, because if he would, was, what would it be called? Prophecy. There's a difference. Remember, you have to go back. We're finding grace from Genesis to Revelation. So God's going to have grace and show Balaam his favor in this whole situation to get a point across to the king of Moab. And if you'll read, and I'm not going to take the time to read all of it, but I will kind of give you background information. We're going to look at chapters 22 through 24. 
uh, and we'll see this. So Balak um, saw that Israel had defeated the Amalekites, the Amorites, I'm sorry, the Amorites, and he got scared. He's terrified. Here's this huge mass of people in the desert now, and they've already defeated one big uh, army of the Amorites. And so King Moab, the king of Moab, Balak, gets scared. And he's got to figure out a way that he can get a hand up on these Israelites. Remember, they took a census. Remember we talked about the book of Numbers, first chapter, they can't take a census. Why were they taking a census? Of all the men 20 years and over, for what purpose? To see who could fight. So now they've defeated the Amorites and Moab, the king of Moab is scared and he sends down for the elders and uh, he says, listen to this, now this horde, verse 4, chapter 22, this horde will lick up all that is around us. What he's saying is Israel's going to whip us all. This mass of people in the desert, they're going to whip us all. So he sent messengers to, ba to Balaam, uh, verse 5. Now, even in some translations, it will tell you that he's a prophet. Not in the original language. See in parentheses here, I believe it says that he's a foreteller of events. Alright? And the word in King James is translated sorcerer. There is the people that have come out, he says, he tells the men, tell Balaam, that there's a people that have come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the surface of the earth. That's how big he thought they were. And he gets scared. And what he does is he's sending these elders down, and he wants Balaam to come up, and he wants him to curse the children of Israel. And so these men come down, they end up spending the night with him, and he asks, this is a sight, he asks the Lord, God, Jehovah, what he should do. There's a lot of religions uh, at this particular time that were looking to God, but they were pagan idol worship involved in it, especially Gentiles. They'd have heard, they had heard about the God of Israel. And some of them would even pray to Him, but they were still worshiping idols and had paganism mixed in with a lot of their teachings and their religion. But he calls on the God of Jehovah and he tells them, send those guys away. You're not going down there. You can't curse them. I'm going to bless them. I've already blessed them. So he sends them away. And Balak sends them back and says, I'll pay you. I'm going to show you honor. I'm going to give you all kinds of money if you'll come down here and you'll curse Israel so that I can have a hand up on them and I'll defeat the armies of Israel. How many of you have heard this story? few of us. Most of us haven't, and that's good to go back over it and, rev and get fresh revelation, but for some of us, of us, it's the first time that we've seen it. So, he, they come down a second time, and he sends more, chapter 22, verse 15, he sends more numerous men and more distinguished men than the first ones. They came to Balaam and said to him, Thus Balak says, I beg you, let nothing hinder you from coming to me. For I will give you great honor, he says, I'm going to pay you. I will do whatever you tell me, so please come and curse the people of Israel. Balaam answered the servants, Even if Balak were to give me his whole house of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight and I will find out well what else the Lord will say to me. So he, again, he tells him, spend the night here. I'm going to go pray. Whatever the Lord tells me, that's what I'm going to do. And he's a Gentile. He's not a Jew following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a Gentile. God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, get up and go with them. But you shall still do only what I tell you. Now, verse 21 is significant. Chapter 22, verse 21. And Balaam got up in the morning and saddled his donkey. It, it, uh, it's significant for one reason here. Because he was very anxious to get on the way. He didn't have his ser servants to saddle the donkey. He saddled his donkey himself. So which shows that he's very anxious. He wasn't waiting for anybody else to get up and do it. He's ready to go. Now God didn't really want him to go. He's saying if these men have called you to go, you go. 
but he gets all anxious about it. So basically, this really isn't God's will, but he's giving him permission to go. But because he's so anxious in it, God feels that his intentions are wrong. What do you think he's going for? The money. He's going for the honor and the money. I love this. Starting with verse 22, look at it. If you can put it 22, 22 on the screen. But God's anger was kindled because he was going. God got angry at him. Just gave him permission. But it was the intent. Why? What does God look at? Our heart. And the angel, look at here and notice that the word angel is capitalized. That's, a, that's a, an appearance of God. That's God showing up. And Balaam can't see it. If you read this story three different times, he's riding the donkey, and the angel of the Lord stands in front of the donkey with a sword the first time. The donkey sees it, but the man can't. And the donkey stops. And he starts beating that donkey, and the donkey takes off, and the angel of the Lord appears again. And the second time, he's in between two stone walls, and he pins and crushes Balaam's foot against one of the walls. And you, can you imagine that poor donkey? Now Balaam's beating, he's beating him harder than he was beating him the first time. What are you doing, you stupid mule? And he sees the angel of the Lord, Lord the third time, and the donkey bows down to the ground and just about throws Balaam off the donkey. And then the scripture says, and Balaam's eyes were open. And what, something triggered my thinking here the, today reading this when he said, the donkey begins to talk. The donkey turns around and is talking to Balaam, and he says, How long have I been your donkey? How long have you been riding me? Now, son, right there, I was gone. I'd either passed out and said, What is this? or I'd take off running somewhere. And the donkey's talking to him, and he says, How long have I been your donkey? Have I ever done anything like this to you before? Now, Lisa thinks her doggies talk to her. She even posted something on Facebook about it. We talk to them all the time, Ginger and Petey. I've known Lisa now for close to seven years. We've been married five, and I inherit those dogs. And when I met her, she told me they were on their last leg. Yeah. <laughs> seven years ago, they were all on their last leg. <laughs> Duffy's back here testifying. And they're still kicking. One's got congestive heart failure. One's got arthritis in his hip and drags his legs. And they're healthy as horses. They're going to live to be 100. But thank God they have not talked to me yet. If they start turning around and say, what are you doing? If, if they start talking, they're probably going to tell on me. <laughs> when mommy's not here, this is what daddy does. But that don't, can you imagine a donkey talking to him and then saying, have I ever done this to you before? And then the eyes of Balaam are opened and he sees the angel of the Lord. And God lets him go on down. But he says to him, you can only speak what I tell you to speak. So we fast forward and now they are down. Um, verse 36. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is at the border of the Arnon River at the farthest end of the border. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not urgently send word to you to call you? Why did you not come to me immediately? He said, I said I'm going to pay you. Honor you, that means pay. So Balaam said to Balak, Indeed, I have come to you now. Listen, but I am able to say, but am I able to say anything at all? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I shall speak. Now Balak wants him to curse and we're going to hear th three different oracles, four different oracles. Some people break them, the fourth one down in this three separate ones, so there's actually seven oracles, but it's one, two, three, and four, and the fourth one has three different parts of it that make it seven oracles. And we can learn something from each of these things, and they're coming from the mouth of God. The first time... Let's see, verse 39. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kirath Huzoth. Huzoth. Did I do all right with that? Kirath Huzoth. 
Balak sacrificed an ox and sheep and sent some to Balaam and to the leaders who were with him. Then it came about in the morning that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to a high place of Baal. Now the high place, have you ever, y'all, any of y'all ever sang that song, we're going up, we're going to pull down the high places? The high place is any place of worship, idol worship. They were called high places. It could be a mountain. It could even be a man-made elevation. But it was a place of worship where the false gods and pagan gods. So what Balak is doing here is he is taking him up to a place of worship where they worshipped Baal. And from this place of uh, worship of Baal, he can see a portion of the Israelites. He can't see them all. He can only see a portion of them according to verse 41. So then we jump into chapter 43. Balaam said to Balak, build seven altars for me here. They did. They killed a lamb and a bull, a ram and a bull on each of the altars. And then Balaam Balaam said to Balak, stay here at the burnt offering and I will go. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me and whatever he says, that's what I'm going to say. So he went up to the mountain. Now God met Balaam. Have I prepared seven altars? I've offered a bull and a ram. Then the Lord put a speech in Balaam's mouth. This is the first one. We turn to Balak and say thus. Balaam returned, and behold, he was standing, Balak, by the burnt offering with all the leaders of Moab, and Balaam began to speak his first oracle. Listen. He speaks, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Syria, from the mountains to the east, saying, Come, curse the descendants of Jacob, and come violently denounce Israel. How shall I curse Those whom God has not cursed. You say, what significance does this have for us? You're going to see. Or how can I violently denounce those the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see Israel, and from the hills I look at them. Behold, the people of Israel shall dwell alone and will not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust or the descendants of Jacob and the number of even the fourth part of Israel? So he's seeing a portion, it's a fourth, because remember, we looked at the camp of Israel, remember, that's not a very good drawing, but what did it look like? It looked like a cross, so when he's looking down, he can only see a fourth of the tribes of Israel. And he says, they're so vast, who can number them? He, what's he doing? He's, because the Lord told him, he's telling about the promise that God gave to Abraham, what was that promise? That you can't count the descendants. You're not going to be able to count them. Why? Because God blessed them. Let me die the death of a righteous man, those who are upright, who was upright and standing with God, and let me end like my end be like his. What's he saying? There's no way that you can curse what God has blessed. That's the first lesson that we learn from Balaam. Are you blessed? Yes. Then you can't be cursed. There cannot be a curse that anyone can put on you. There, there, there's no, a preacher can't get up in the pulpit and preach something to you and tell you that you'll be cursed. Why? Because I'm blessed. And you can't curse what God has blessed. If you've received the washing of the sins from, by the blood of Christ and you've believed, put your faith in, and trust in the finished work, you're blessed. You're highly favored. It's what Pastor Wright tells you to say all the time. Put your hands in the air and say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Well, if you're blessed and you're highly favored, every time you're saying that, you're decreeing and declaring, I can't be cursed. So why do we walk around as believers thinking that we can be cursed? And I'll tell you where most of that teaching comes from. It's not the world. It's the pulpit. The pulpit will try to put back on us a cursing under certain types of rules, regulations, laws, and they'll tell you that you're going to be cursed. You can't be cursed if God's blessed you. Those aren't my words. That's the Word of God. And you can't get around it. Even if you don't believe it, and you're blessed, you still can't be cursed. Now, are there consequences of things that have happened in the past that follow you? Yes, you have to outlive of some of those things. There's consequences of the actions that we had before we accepted Christ that are still following us, but they will, you have to outlive those. But I believe that even those, we, in that sense, we can um, 
live in houses that we didn't build. We can eat from vineyards we didn't plant. What's that? That's sowing where he re that's reaping where he sowed. Amen. Then the second oracle. And of course, Balak gets mad. What have you done? I brought, I brought here to curse the enemies. And Balak said to him, Come with me. I implore you. He takes him to another place. This is the second place. From where you can see them, although you will see only the nearest, not all of them. Again, he's only going to see the part that's near where he takes him to a second high place to look over them. Same thing. Built seven art, uh, altars. The place here is called Pisgah. This just means a hill fortress or a summit peak. This is the mountain range of Nebo in Moab where we saw when we were in Israel. And so the same thing happens. He goes out and then Balaam took up his second discourse and oracle. He says, rise up, O Balak, and hear. Listen closely to me. God is not a man that he should lie. First lesson that we learn, you're blessed. You can't be cursed. Second lesson we learn, God's not a man and he didn't lie, so whatever he said he would do, he's going to do. Amen. So if, God, if you have any promise that you're holding on to and they're all what? Yes and amen in Christ. They're going to be, they're already happening. They're for every one of us as believers. God's not a man that he should lie. So he's not going to tell you that he's going to do this and not do it. Or he's not going to tell you that he's going to do that and then he does something else over here. He's not a man that he would lie nor a son of man that he should repent. What's that mean? He's not going to repent over the things that he says he's going to do, he's going to do. He's not going to change his mind. The word repent here is not to confess his sins and become a believer. The word repent here is he's not going to change his mind. Remember in the Greek even the word repent means metanoia, to change your mind. So this word here, repent, is not God has a sin and he made a mistake and he's got to repent over it. It's God, he's not a man that he's going to lie and he's not going to change his mind about you as his child. He's blessed you and he's not going to change his mind. That's good news. Has he said and he, will he not do it? Or has he spoken will he not make it good and fulfill it? Behold, I have received his command to bless Israel. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. Get a hold of that and get that in your spirit. Let's look up here for just a second. Now, we try to tell you to be a good Berean. What's that? That means whatever you hear here from the pulpit, go home and search it out, study it. See what the Holy Spirit does, deals with you about. Now, some of people have texted me and called me and said, we've, we're doing that to try to prove you wrong. And they end up <laughs> seeing the revelation of grace too by the Holy Spirit. But you have to be cautious who you listen to on television. Who you listen to on the internet? Who you listen to on the radio? So if we're telling you to be a good Berean of what you hear here, then you need to be a good Berean of what you hear on television and on the radio, listen to on the internet. And when you hear one thing one place, and you're hearing something else somewhere else, You've got, you need to search it out. You need to f dig into the Scripture, see what the Holy Spirit is telling you. So... Here's what happens if I get up and tell you you're blessed and you can't be cursed, and then you go home and you turn on the television and there's a preacher on there telling you that if you do this or you do that and you do this, you're cursed. So who's right? You have to go home and open up the Word of God and you have to begin to study and let the Holy Spirit deal with you because I've lost my desire to be right. I want to find the truth. Okay? Because when you know truth, it sets you free. Okay, When you know the truth, that word know there it means by experience. Not just here in your head. When you know the truth, by ex you've experienced the truth, Jesus, it'll set you free. He'll set you free. He's already set us free. You walk in that freedom. So check it out. Find out where these people are coming from because you can't hear from one man of God you're blessed and from another you're cursed. Because Balaam teaches us a lesson here out of the mouth of God, saying, God has blessed you. Now, was Israel obeying Him in everything? Were they keeping all 613 laws? Were they murmuring and complaining? 
And what did God say about them? In the midst of their murmuring and complaining, in the midst of their disobedience, in the midst of them not following every single law, what does He say about them? They're blessed. And He's not going to change His mind about them and He's not going to reverse. Who's true Israel today? Who's the true Jew? The circumcision of the heart. Those who have believed. We are the true Jew. And so if He's speaking that over a nation of people, and now He says, we're true Jews who have believed and had the circumcision of the heart. We're the apple of His eye. And He's blessed you. And He won't reverse it. That's good news. The third oracle. Then Balak said to Balaam, Neither curse them at all or bless them at all. But Balaam answered, Balak, I did not say to you all that the Lord speaks that I must do. Did I not say to you? I'm only going to tell you what the Lord lets me say. So he takes him to a third place. Perhaps it will please God to let you curse them from here. Now, I don't know about you, but Balak is dumber than a sled track. If God wouldn't let him curse him in the first place of the high place of Baal, and he wouldn't let him curse him at Mount Pic. Pikash, Pikshaw, <laughs> Piska, P I S K A H. Now he's not going, he's taking them to a Mount Peor, P E O R, a third place. So, what makes you think that he's going to let, God's going to let him curse them there? Hello. Nobody's home. Yeah, he's getting paid. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as he had done before. He didn't build the seven altars the third time. He didn't sacrifice the ram or the bull this time. He didn't go to a desolate place or a high mountain, get away from Balak and say, stay here by the burnt offering. He didn't do it this time. Now he knows God's talking to him. He did not go as he had done times before superstitiously to seek omens and signs in the natural. But he set his face towards the wilderness, and Balaam raised his eyes, and he saw Israel living in their tents tribe by tribe. Now he sees all of Israel. Not just seeing the nearest portion or a fourth of, the, of them. When he looked at Pit from Pisgah, he was seeing Reuben. The Bible says, what? She's helping me. So he's seeing Reuben, just a portion. Then he sees the nearest part. Now he's seeing them tribe by tribe. Wow, the Lord has opened his eyes to see them all. And the Spirit of God came upon him. The first two times it doesn't say that the Spirit of the Lord was up on him. He was speaking the words of the Lord, but now there's a special message coming forth because the Spirit of the Lord is on him, and he took up his third discourse. And the oracle of Balaam, and the oracle of the man whose eyes were opened, the oracle of the one who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of Almighty falling down but having his eyes open and uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob! And your tabernacles, O Israel, like the valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Look at verse 7. Water, that is great blessing, will flow from his buckets. And his offspring will live by many waters. His king will be higher than Agag. And his kingdom shall be exalted. Who's he talking about? Jesus. He's prophesying of the Messiah now. He's, God brought Israel out of Egypt like a strong ox. He will devour Gentile nations, his enemies, will be, and will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them. He bowed down to rest. He lies down as a lion. And a lioness who dares to rouse up. Blessed, O God, is he who blesses you. And cursed of God is he who curses you. That's just not for the nation of Israel. That's for God's people. If someone blesses you, God blesses them. If someone curses you, if they're not under the blood, they're cursed. But they can receive the blessing because the curse hung on the tree. Galatians, the third chapter. What's he talking about? He's talking about the coming of the Messiah that will take care of this. And they will continue to be blessed. You think Balak's angry by this time? Three times Balaam has blessed the nation of Israel, the tribes of Israel. And Balaam, or Balak wants them to be cursed. He says in verse 10 of chapter 24, I called you to curse my enemies, but behold, you have done nothing but bless them. Three times now. Therefore now flee to your own place. I've intended to honor you greatly, but behold, the Lord has held you back from honor. He's saying, because you obeyed the Lord, I'm, I'm not going to give you a dime. 
Remember, verse 12, Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers who had sent for me? Even if he would give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord to do either good or bad on my own accord. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. And now look, I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you as what this people Israel will do to your people in the days to come. And so he gives the fourth oracle and the final oracle. Hello. He took up his fourth discord, the oracle of Balaam, the oracle of him who hears the words of the Lord God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of Almighty. Let me stop right there. Fifty-one times between Genesis 22 and 24, fifty-one times, he uses five different references of the names of God. He uses Yahweh. Keep doing that. It's Y H W H. This is his covenant name. What are we looking for? Grace. He uses Should I? What's that mean? Almighty, more than enough, he uses El, which is the singular of God. He uses Elohim, which is the plural of God. What, what do we mean the plural of God? The Trinity. That's the three in one. He, he loses, uses El Yon. which is God Most High. Fifty-one times in two chapters, he uses five different names of God. This is his covenant name, Yahweh. Old covenant. I heard you the first time. I thought I turned this sucker off. In this last oracle... Verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Still prophesying of the coming of the Messiah. A star shall come forth from the descendants of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of the descendants of Israel, and shall crush the forehead of Moab, and destroy all the sons of Sheth. Adam, Edom shall be taken as a possession. Seir, Israel's enemies, also will be a possession, while Israel performs violently. Valiantly, not violently. <laughs> They're not going to be violent. One from the descendants of Jacob shall have dominion and will destroy the remnant from the city. And he goes on to continue to talk about. And he's here, he's talking. Who, who's the one that's rising up out of Jacob? That was the line of the tribe of Judah. He came out of the lineage of King David. And he's talking about the Messiah God. What gets me here in all of this teaching tonight, and as we find grace, that even at the waters of Mar Maribel, when they were in contention and striving with God, He didn't look at their behavior, He still blessed them. When the enemy one is out to curse you, and He can use many different ways to try to attempt to curse you, but because you've been blessed, He will not succeed. He's already been defeated. He, there's no weapon that he was ever formed that can prosper. Every tongue that even would rise up against you in condemnation, he will disperse in several different ways. He can't curse you. He can't bring anyone against you that would curse you. Now I'm going to tell you something. If, there, if there's anything that you ever want to get a hold of and tuck away in here, is you can't be cursed. Because when the enemy... He, remember, we, we know he will come and try to accuse us. Who does he... Accuse. He accuses you to you because he doesn't have a place in heaven. He can't get to the throne. He's been cast out. And so he will come and whisper to you. When he comes and whispers to you, he's lying to you about you. And so what we have to tell him is we have to remind him, you're defeated. You've already been rendered powerless, so none of your weapons can affect me. 
and I've been blessed, so you can't curse me. Uh, notice I didn't say that he's not real and that you don't have an enemy and he's not going to lie to you. I said he, he, he is real, he will come to you, he will try to attack you, but you have greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Who's in the, in the world? The enemy, the, the defeated one, the cast out one. Uh, but when he does come, we listen to the voice of the Spirit telling us and reminding of us, us of who we are in Christ. And who are we? We're blessed and highly favored. And because of that, if I'm being blessed, I can't be cursed. Amen? Stand with me if you would. Yes? God showed Moses grace because in the 17th chapter of Matthew, Moses gets to yeah. That's right. That's right. Did you hear that? God even showed Moses grace. He didn't let him... He said, He didn't... Notice he didn't tell Moses that he wouldn't see the, get to the promised land. He said, you won't lead this people into the promised land. Because he shows up in Matthew the 17th chapter on a mount called Transfiguration <laughs> and he stepped foot in the promised land. That's grace. That's grace. That's good. Thank you for reminding us about that. Any word on anybody's heart? Yes. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Dot. Dot. Mm -hmm. They're looking for cancer and dot. Well, before you got here, we rebuked that cancer in Jesus' name as we were praying. And we're thankful that you all continue to pray for Dot. Yeah, good to see Missy back. Amen. We love her. Anything I messed up or you need to help me with, she's good about that. Remember Hayden, please continue to pray for him as you pray. Um, looking forward to this series as we continue on the five core values of grace life if you weren't able to be here sunday go and listen to the message on our podcast or watch it on youtube because it's going to give you as we build on this exactly the vision of grace life and our core values and if you're this is your church you need to know what we believe and why we believe it and where we're headed uh, with that amen so i encourage you to do that Dad, Mom, Jennifer will be going to Indiana Friday and then Illinois on Sunday uh, to preach. So remember them uh, in prayer uh, as well. Yes, we prayed for Kathy Sunday in both services. She leaves tomorrow. You leave tomorrow? Yeah. Yes. It, Way of Life Ministries Facebook page. You can keep up with her while she's gone and what they're doing uh, there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Alex taking pictures over there so um, would you remember uh, the all of the churches in the Putnam County area we meet a collect as a collective body uh, from time to time we had a meeting today different churches facing different situations uh, within their congregations pray for their pastors uh, that God would continue to, to use them, that lead God and direct them, um, that those that need to be removed would be removed and those that need to stay would stay, despite what people would say and it would look like in the physical, um, that God, because when He opens a door, no man can shut it, and when He shuts a door, no man can open it. Amen? Um, I'm looking at this message from... Tim DePiro to pray for a situation in Mexico uh, tonight. So would you remember Mono de Ayuda and the ranch in Mexico uh, tonight as you pray? I feel like there's somebody that has a word or something on their heart that needs to be shared. Yes. Yeah. Lee's thanking everybody for prayer for her mom. She's been in ICU. She's out and she's home. And uh, your home taking care of so pray for Joe and Lee as they take care of her mother. All right. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay. Father, we thank you for the privilege to share your word. 
thank you for the honor of um, being called to pastor this church and these people. Thank you for the love that they have for us and for you. Father, but thankful so much for your love for us that passes all understanding. Help each one now as they go. Watch over, protect them, intervene from accident, injury, and harm. We pray, Father, that you would continue to heal bodies, that you would restore in the physical and the, and the spiritual, that you would help in the mental, the emotional uh, aspects of everyone's life. We pray for the churches in this area. We pray, Father, that you would lead God and direct each pastor. We pray, Father, that those that uh, feel neglected and rejected at this time would be encouraged and lifted. We pray, Father, for those uh, that uh, just have a job and what the Word says would be a hireling, that you would help them to move on to something else and you'd bring in someone that would encourage and lift the church. For those that are uh, ministering to the church, encourage them, give them the Word for their congregation for this week, that every life would be encouraged, that the lost would be saved, and that your name would be glorified. Yeah. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.